It seems like God is repeatedly reaching out to Joe Rogan, but in one of his latest conversations, it would almost appear as if he is refusing to engage in some of the conversations regarding Jesus, Christianity, and specifically the crucifixion and possibility for the resurrection. In the past several months, Joe Rogan has featured guests like Stephen C. Myers, who shared his perspective on intelligent design. You were saying something about whatever this intelligent thing is, creating us somehow or another in its image, or somehow or another thinking the way it thinks? Yeah, this was this was the idea of the early scientists who got science going. To having Hulk Hogan wear a John 316 shirt on the podcast and saying the verse out loud to Joe Rogan. God so the Lord gave their only begotten son, that who ever believe, you know, they gave his son will not perish but have everlasting life. And most notably, a story that we broke, Joe Rogan singing a classic Christian song from the 1970s about coming to Jesus because he has the answers. Why don't you come to Jesus? He's got the answer. But in episode 247, Joe Rogan sat down with Brian Mirarosco and he started bringing up some of the archaeological evidence for Christianity and then mentioned the crucifixion. But what Joe Rogan does is very interesting in terms of how he refuses to engage in this conversation. So this is at the two hour and 56 minute mark of this podcast, and he brings up some archaeological evidence for the early underground church in Rome and some of the ritualistic things that they were doing in terms of preserving their community. So it's the archaeological team that is responsible uh, for the preservation and conservation of all these ancient sites. And I think it's it's an aspect of, of early Christianity that like, very few people know about. What was happening underground, there was this Yale professor who sadly uh, died um, in recent years. It was Ramsey McMullen. And what he talks about are these underground, um, these underground chill-outs. They were called... Now, it's important to note that Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire for the first several hundred years, and the church didn't meet in buildings the way we meet. Now, though, the moment that Christians could meet in buildings, they began to meet in buildings. So this was predominantly an underground Jewish movement because it was illegal and hostile. And then over time, Rome became less and less hostile. And then eventually Constantine came to faith and things were more normalized. Called uh, Vigilia. The Latin word for them is refrigerium, where we get the word refrigerator. So they were like underground chill outs where mm. uh, certainly the Romans, and it's believed the earliest Christians would have gone to celebrate um, the dead with, uh, with sacramental wine, with celebratory wine. They, they would have a wine ceremony in these dank chambers underground to like usher the dead into the afterlife or bring them, bring them refreshment. They were called refrigeria. Now, it's, it's interesting to note because if you guys aren't familiar, but in, in Jewish culture, specifically when the man who comes to Jesus and says he wants to follow him, and, but he first has to bury his dad, he says, let the dead bury their dead. Why? It's because... Christianity, early Christianity, was highly influenced by Jewish culture. And in Jewish culture, the process of burying somebody wasn't just having a funeral and maybe a wake for them or a memorial service the way we do. Now, no, these were more elaborate uh, processes where they would usher out the spirits of the dead. And obviously, Christianity, probably in its earliest form, was influenced by some of these things. And that is kind of what he's getting at with these ceremonies that they would do. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of unclear when the Refrigeria, a, a pagan Roman ceremony, became like a proto-Eucharistic Christian mass. Like the line, again, the line is very blurred at this period of time, uh, which I call the pagan continuity hypothesis. The, the, this notion that the, 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 the older wine drinking consumption by the Romans, the Greeks before them, somehow influenced, at least in some, in some cases, the earliest celebrations of the mass. And so, I so he's saying that the Roman customs for drinking the wine were influencing Christianity. I would beg to differ and say that perhaps the Christian influenced the Romans or that at some point they become a hybrid in the way that as Christianity became more normalized in Rome, they started taking over the old temples of pagans and converted them into churches. That is a historical fact. I just show this quickly to show um, that, you know, in these wine parties, uh, Ramsey has this great line saying that th this was not just picnicking at the bottom there. He said this was religion. Mm -hmm. So even though it looks like a picnic, it looks like they were gathering over like, kind of like almost like a Mexican Day of the Dead ceremony. Like mm -hmm. they would meet by the graveyard to, uh, to remember the dead and the ancestors. Yeah, there was, there was wine and food, but this was, this was religion to the ancient Romans. And I think to, to the Romanized Christians who followed them in the first, first century, second century, third century. That, that's just a bunch more text from uh, a Catholic encyclopedia, by the way, from 1907, if I'm not mistaken. And it talks about how the celebration of the dead and this funeral banquet you see right in the middle there, mm -hmm. this notion that the funeral banquet is really kind of at the core of what the early mass was. Even if you go back to the gospels, it was you know, Jesus asking for the commemoration of this event, you know, do this in memory of me. As you do so he's talking about the Last Supper, but also where we get our communion sacrament from today, right? Do this in remembrance of me in terms of taking communion. He's kind of connecting this to some of their other funeral type rituals. 
I find it interesting that he's connecting it to Romans influencing Christians and again, not the other way around, but that's neither here nor there. He's leaning into a conversation or perhaps attempting to lean into a conversation with Joe Rogan about Christianity and the archaeology and all these different things that, that are discovered. Do this in memory of me. Remember my life, death, and eventual resurrection. This is... Ooh, there's that word resurrection. I, lo I love when the resurrection Jesus comes up on Joe Rogan. This is sort of the, the prototype for, for the mass. And so it's important to remember that the funeral banquet was there to bind those together who remained faithful to the memory of Jesus after, after his death. It's very similar to this Roman refrigerium. So I, I give that all that as background just to show you the first couple images from the hypogeum. So if you uh, skip to the next one, or maybe, so that, that's what it looks like when you go underground. Um, there was, it was discovered in 1919, I think, as, as a fiat shop around the corner. It was trying to expand into a sunken garage. They, they came across these, uh, the, these monuments, wow. which, which is not uncommon in Greece and Italy yeah. and around the Mediterranean. So they found this, this, this hypogeum, which dates to the 3rd century uh, AD. So we don't have firm dates. It could be anywhere from like 220 to 250 AD. So this is the time period we're talking about. So it's important to note that Christianity didn't become legal in Rome until 313 AD. And so this is very early on in the process of the church. These, are, it was, these were tombs. They're rock cut tombs in the hypogeum here. If you go to the next one, uh, one of the first things I saw when I went into the hypogeum was this, which, uh, you know, it's, it's a little strange because, again, you're trying to figure out if this is a Roman pagan refrigerium or if this is a Christian celebration of some sort of Eucharist. Because, again, th this site is controlled by the Vatican. The Vatican has preserved this uh, for, uh, uh, for, for reasons. Um, and, you know, it's been said by the Pontifical Commission that th th these are some of the most explicit and concrete evidence for the origins of Christianity. So wow. Some of the most concrete evidence for the— So this stuff is, is, is fascinating to me that he's presenting all this. And the conversation kind of takes a weird turn where they start getting into one of the images depicting— a witch that was doing sorcery and giving them drugs, psychedelic drugs, and, and this whole thing. You know, whether this is purely pagan or Christian is sort of a, a moment of, of debate. But, you know, if you just look at it, what's odd is that you see 12 people gathered around a table. And when you think of 12 people gathered around a table, you think of something like the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's pretty clear that what's important to this dinner is the chalice that, that's being lifted by, uh, by the servant there. Or maybe it's a priest of some sort. So it's clear that whatever's happening, mm -hmm. wine is important to this gathering of 12 people. The interesting part is the woman who's appearing in this the This could be perhaps the Last Supper, the one, of the, one of the earliest depictions of the Last Supper scene. I don't, I don't know. I do, I do find it very interesting, though. Back, if you look closely, there's sort of like the, this effigy of a woman descending exactly from the background to the foreground. It's thought that she is uh, Aurelia Prima, and Aurelia was one of the, the, the dead women to whom the hypogeum was, was dedicated. And so what they think, that's her. This is one, one of the Vatican's interpretations, is that that's her emerging from the world of the dead to take place in this funeral banquet, Sheesh. in this ceremony. We're not really sure. How do they interpret that? Because she's not seated at the table. And because what they, what they think this is, is that whenever, especially because of... Okay. <clears throat> so, like I said, the conversation turns into a loose connection to psychedelics and the early church and overlap with Rome and all these sorts of things. But what really gets interesting is later on in the conversation where Joe Rogan asks him this specific question in his response and then Joe Rogan's lack of response or lack of engaging. Like just to know that you're there in this place where these people have these experiences and the wonder of what was it like, hmm. you know, could imagine... If you had the ability to travel back in time to any point in, in human history, where would you go? What a, what a great question, right? The ability to travel back any point in human history. Listen to Brian's answer. I, have to, I can only choose one? Yeah, just one. Maybe the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's interesting. Okay, now listen, listen to Joe Rogan's response and then where the conversation goes <laughs> for the last 30 minutes of this conversation. Just to find out if it really happened? Hmm. What if it didn't? Would you tell anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, just to find out if it really happened, what if it didn't? Would you tell anybody? And, and I would say, the, I think the question beneath the question is, the crucifixion happening points to the resurrection, as I'll get into in a moment. But let's just hear, uh, hear Joe Rogan kind of take this conversation a whole other direction and not wanting to engage. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be in big trouble. Yeah. I think I would choose uh, ancient Egypt. <laughs> Notice that Brian awkwardly stopped. As if Joe Rogan was going to pry some more about the crucifixion. He doesn't ask Joe Rogan the question back. And Joe Rogan answers the question for himself without it being asked or... Right? Like, it's it's kind of an awkward pause there. But he starts going into ancient Egypt. Now, there's a, there's a reason for this we're going to get into in a moment about why the question of the crucifixion is important. And why maybe he's dodging, digging, digging deeper into this. 
What do you want to see? I want to see the construction of the pyramids. Huh. Okay, so he wants to see the construction of the pyramids. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to show you guys four facts about the crucifixion and why it's so significant and why so many people are afraid to lean into this conversation potentially, okay? Because it, it takes you to a, a very logical facts about it. Okay, now, before we get into that, I just want to share a little bit about my own journey in terms of coming to faith. When I was a young kid, I developed a lot of hostility towards the church because I was an altar boy and some things happened in the Armenian Orthodox Church that led me to really be ostracized from my community. The short version of it is that there were some older teenage altar boys and essay happened and I'll spare you details, but I grew very, very hostile towards God because I believe that, man, there's no God. And if there is a God, he surely doesn't give a crap about me for allowing all the evil things to happen to me as a, as a child, right? When I was, this is when I was seven years old. What I discovered was that all throughout my childhood, there would be different people that God would send to tell me about the gospel in Jesus. At the age of 11, I ended up getting arrested for breaking into houses, and I got served um, and in my sentencing, thankfully, I avoided jail time, but I had to do community service. The community service that I did was at a local church. So instantly, I'm being exposed to this local church of having to fulfill these community service hours. At the same time, the apartment manager that was overseeing our entire complex when I was living in Normal Heights, San Diego— got radically saved. Her name was Cherie. And she converts our entire apartment complex, except my family and the other Armenian family there, into becoming Christian. I thought this was extremely crazy. They were nuts. But all along, from the sixth grade in, until the ninth grade, I am having multiple people share Jesus with me, share the gospel with me, share uh, even prophetic words with me about some of the things that came to fruition in this season of my life, about God using me to speak to multitudes, right? This is as I'm a jacked up, broken kid, didn't have his dad in his life, going through all kinds of stuff, getting arrested, and people were speaking these things into my life very, 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 very early on uh, that I, I didn't believe. But then eventually, shocker, my freshman year of high school, I started dating a girl. The only time I could see her on the weekends is if I went with her to church on Sunday with, with her family. And I started just kind of casually going to church. I was still calling myself an atheist, and then I slowly shifted over to theist, and then I started having other theological conversations, and ultimately I ended up reading a book called The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. The book is actually right right behind me, right there. That's that's the book right right there. A great book. And it started to deal with all the questions that I had, and it gave me sufficient answers. And so I ultimately, through two years of soul searching and, and fighting God, I came to faith, gave my life to Jesus, haven't looked back since. That was over 20 years ago. Now, I think, my opinion, there's a similar thing happening with Joe Rogan right now. God continues sending people, and Jesus comes up from some predictable guests and then some unpredictable guests. And maybe maybe he's tired of someone like me making reaction videos to it. I don't know. But it seems like he doesn't lean into this conversation. And this is why. This is my theory why. Four facts about the crucifixion of Jesus that lead to a very uncomfortable conclusion regarding who Jesus really is. Check these out. This is from William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is an amazing apologist who there's a petition to try to get him on Joe Rogan. I would love to see that. But according to William Lane Craig, these are all established facts by not just Christian historians and scholars, but non-Christian historians and scholars. So again, this is if we're leaning into the crucifixion conversation, these are the four facts around the crucifixion of Jesus. Number one, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb. Jesus didn't have a tomb. He was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. And uh, if you go to Israel today, there's two potential locations on where they think the tomb could be. Okay, so this is a, a, a historical fact. The second one is that on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. So the empty tomb is acknowledged by historians. The body was missing. Point number three, on Different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead, okay? So in Acts, it says that Jesus was on the earth for 40 more days. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes that he once appeared to over 500 people, that there are different people in different situations and individuals who ended up seeing Jesus from 
the, the dead. This is I- I- incredible, right? Even his own brother, James, who was not a disciple of his during his lifetime, ends up becoming a disciple. In, in Acts 15, it alludes that he is kind of the final voice in the church of Jerusalem as they're discussing the gospel going forth to the Gentile. He gives the final word on that, right? And then four, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, despite their having every po- disposition to the contrary, especially when it's someone like Jesus, the brother of James, or someone like Paul, who was persecuting Christians. And even a Bar Ehrman would contend to this point that they were sincere in their belief that Jesus had risen from the dead, despite not having any sort of model for this. There was this, this wasn't something that was in their history. Remember, the disciples were looking for a, a end times political leader, right, to bring peace. And the Jews are still waiting for that sort of Messiah. But Jesus didn't come as a lion, as he will in the second coming. He came as a lamb. And so when you look at these four facts, these four facts of history, you're presented with a very logical and linear argument that perhaps, just perhaps, the resurrection of Jesus actually happened. And just perhaps this little movement that ended up spreading to all parts of the world is true and is real. And so that's my theory on why Joe Rogan perhaps didn't want to lean into this conversation, or maybe he's just tired of Christians like me making reaction videos. But it's not just celebrities and influential people who we want to see come to faith. I think it would be amazing if Joe Rogan came to faith. But it's the people in our day-to-day lives. It's our family members. It's those people that we come in contact in our community. And one of the best ways that we could be praying for them is by writing down those prayers in something like our prayer journal that you could pick up today over at blessgodprayer.shop. The reason why we recommend writing down your prayers in a prayer journal is because it helps you remember and it helps you create a structure and disciplines around your prayers. And so if you haven't gotten your Bless God Prayer Journal, you can scoop one up at blessgodprayer.shop. We got it in the black and the tan. And if you can't afford it, that's fine. We got Bless God PDF dot shop. We can get the PDF version, download it, print it, and just write into it or just get a blank notebook. But really try writing out prayers for specific people that you're hoping to see come to faith in Jesus. And if you want to see the time where Joe Rogan sung the lyrics, why don't you come to Jesus? He's got the answer. Check out this video over here. I'll see you over there. All right. Peace.